Hello, commentary fans. This is Mike again, and we I am back with the next commentary in the Titus Andronicus commentary project. Um, we're going to do another Frankenstein film today, The Son of Frankenstein, which is a very good... Uh, it's a great horror film in the classic Universal series. And it's great for a lot of some different reasons than the first two Frankenstein films. In a lot of ways, it represents the last, um, a, I would say, horror, horror film that, of the Universal cycle to really be an A horror film before they became B movies. And it's a great film to celebrate. Um, you know, we did Batman's 75th anniversary celebration last time, and this film is also celebrating its 75th anniversary, so let's not waste any time and get into it. I'm paused right before the Universal logo comes up, and I'm going to start the film in three seconds, like we always do. One, two, and three. This is the first film of the second uh, part of the Universal Horror Cycle. The Lemleys are no no longer running Universal. Um, it's changed hands, and around 1935 or so, the censorship gets to be a bit too much, especially in Great Britain, and they decide to completely end production of horror movies. And it's not just Universal, it's pretty much across the board. And unfortunately, this devastates the career of Bela Lugosi. Uh, Karloff, I think, is does a little bit better. He's considered something of a character actor. And... Uh, He's able to, you know, step out of the Frankenstein persona. He gets a little bit of work. But um, Lugosi is completely devastated. He doesn't get any film work for a stretch of about two years. And during this time, he loses um, the house that Dracula brought bought it gets foreclosed on and his son is born and he can't afford to pay the medical bills and he has to apply to the union to get some aid in that and horror films were gone I guess Hollywood had the bright notion that people didn't want to see horror films anymore but um but, of course, they aren't the smartest people. <laughs> and around 1938, or late 37, 38, a uh, theater in Los Angeles that's run by a German immigrant, I believe his name was Emil Eumann, something along those lines. His theater is failing, and uh, in a last ditch effort or I don't even know if it was last ditch effort it was just something different he arranges a double no actually people forget but it was actually a triple bill of Dracula Frankenstein and the son of Kong <laughs> talk about uh, underwhelming third picture of it but uh, he discovers that horror is very much alive, that audiences never really want to completely be rid of horror. And this picture is, um, I mean, this uh, promotion is an outstanding success. And uh, the lines run across the block. His theater is saved. He's making record profits. 
and Universal finds out about this because they obviously lease the films out to them fairly cheaply and they're like what the heck is going on here and so they like decide hey this might be a great opportunity to make some money and so they say will this work in other areas of the country and so they print create uh, strike about I don't know, like 500 prints of Dracula and Frankenstein to market across the country. And surprise, surprise, uh, the same success is met everywhere. People are as much in love with the monsters as they were in 1931. And so Universal says, let's get back in the monster business. And... We get the son of Frankenstein, which picks up the action about a generation or so after the Bride of Frankenstein, which, as we know, kind of ended on a conclusive note. And so a lot of things are different here. Um, I think you'll notice right away that uh, there isn't that sardonic wit that we got from Whale. Instead, that this is uh, more of a, I would say, I've heard it compared to a swashbuckling film, more of a family-friendly film. Uh, in the documentary Frankenstein Goes to Hollywood, which is an outstanding uh, documentary. If you haven't seen it, Mark Gatiss of Sherlock fame called it uh, kind of a Earl Flynn swashbuckler meets uh, Frankenstein. And I don't know if I quite agree with that, but I just do sort of see the comparison. Everything's a little bit bigger in this one. Um you'll notice that this is the longest universal horror film and the sets are some of the most extravagant. They really went all out with this and uh, it's very noticeable. Um, it's directed by Roland V. Lee, who also did a companion piece to this film called The Tower of London, which is kind of like a Richard the Third uh, melodrama horror fantasy, and uh, it's kind of a costume drama. And I think that's sort of what I think uh, *Son of Frankenstein* feels like in some ways. Uh, here we have uh, Basil Rathbone, who I haven't introduced yet. He plays Wolf, the son of uh, Colin Clive's Henry Frankenstein. And um, you're in the midst of a rainstorm at the beginning of the film. Wolf's an interesting character. He's, uh, they really go into his motivations over the course of the film. And I think it's an interesting uh, exploration of the classic mad scientist trope. I think we'll see here in this film how, you know, the intent of the scientist kind of becomes mad later on. And Basil Rathbone is uh, terrific in the part. And uh, um, we also have Lionel Atwill, who I don't believe we've been introduced to yet. But this is his finest uh, work. He plays Inspector Krogh. There's the first hint at Bela Lugosi, who um, I definitely think is the highlight of this picture. Here's some of this outstanding set design. This looks like it took up an entire soundstage and it's just really really incredible you know um, we've 
obviously talked about uh, German expressionism a great deal on the on this channel, and um, I really think Son of Frankenstein does a really fine job of marrying German expressionist sets to the lavish Hollywood production. Look at that staircase. It looks like something on a Caligari. <laughs> this opening sequence is uh, covers a pretty large portion of the film, but it does a really good job in creating a foreboding sense of mood. I, like we see... Um, I think it's a good idea or a wise choice by Roland Lee because, um, you know, I think audiences going into this movie kind of knew or they thought they knew what um, a film like this was. And so, um, you know, just going through it and really painstakingly developing Wolf's character kind of makes the introduction of the monster have some weight to it because he's had a commission a fair amount of this film. We have um, Benson. <laughs> One of the uh, biggest differences between uh, Bride of Frankenstein and Wales' original Frankenstein in this film is that the village plays a huge uh, part of the story. Um, the villagers in the town hate Henry Frankenstein. There we have a picture of Colin Clive. It actually does sort of look like him if you pause it there. And that's certainly a big... Uh, theme of the film, Basil Rathbone has, uh, is Wolf Frankenstein, has never met his father and he's sort of in the shadow of him and he hears all these horrible rumors about him and he wants to be able to vindicate him and so uh, a large portion of the film is about uh, an almost vengeance in a way this wolf frankenstein is a little more arrogant than um colin clive's henry was he definitely views the, um, the peasants as superstitious and stupid and um he thinks he's smarter than him and be able to able to uh, bend everyone to his own will. This is a really nice uh, sequence that I think sort of sets up a similarity to uh, Henry. Uh, Wolf here is reading the um, diary or the note of that is accompanying the will. Henry is warning his son that if he wants to, if he's afraid of conquering the unknown and to throw out his records, but if he really wants to discover the secrets, he'll be condemned as a blasphemer, as a blasphemer, obviously. But if he gets uh, past that, the ultimate goal of discovering the unknown will be worth being seen as a pariah. And that's an interesting, certainly an interesting take. Um, definitely goes into the sort of science and ethical questions of the Frankenstein story, and that's really the last instance where uh, the Frankenstein series really want in this and it doesn't this film really isn't all that concerned with that 
but that's a good moment because it you sort of see could see Colin Clive's Frankenstein write that note. It's very much in the spirit of the dialogue in the original Frankenstein. Um, it reminds me a great deal of the moment when he's talking with Professor Waldman in the first film uh, about, you know, wanting to do something that's dangerous and where would people be if they never wondered what lied beyond. And here's the next generation following in that footsteps. There's a lot of foreboding here. Why do you suppose they put these beds in this strange position? An old superstition, if the house is filled with dread, place the beds head to head. <laughs> oh man, that's really, really kind of funny. I like that a lot. <laughs> It really, you know, goes over the top in uh, showing how, um, giving the audience a uh, sense of danger, you know, and uh, they eat up every minute of it. This is such a theatrical thunderstorm, too. Here we have uh, Inspector Krog, who, um, you know, almost more than at will or not at well, almost more than Rathbone is as much the star of this movie, the one of the huge draws to it. Um, of course, we remember him uh, being parodied in Young Frankenstein by Kenneth Mars, who is so funny in the parody. But in here, uh, it's really, really grim. He has the wooden arm, which uh, looks terrific on him, and he moves it really, really well. He wears the body, or he wears it really well, and he's got a great physicality uh, to the part. Um, what we'll see here is that he sort of is a perfect foil to... Wolf Frankenstein. They sort of start off as friendly, but over the course of the film, they grow to uh, hate each other. Um, like I was saying earlier, Wolf Frankenstein is um, sort of the uh, pretentious, rich doctor, and um, uh, Inspector Krog here is sort of a lowly policeman. And uh, he very much believes, I believe that they refer to the monster in this as a murdering ghost. And he's superstitious. And, you know, we have Wolf, who very much believes in science and being able to be in control of the elements. And they're perfect uh, foils for one another. This is Atwell's greatest performance, and that's... Um, uh, that's uh, no small praise because Atwell was a very, very talented um, actor, for sure. The original choice for the role of uh, Wolf Frankenstein was actually um, Peter Lorre, who I think would have been pretty fun in it, but I, I like um, Basil Rathbone a lot. You know, a lot of people um, sort of can't get past the comparison to his uh, Sherlock Holmes performances, but I think that, uh, like, I like that quality, you know, that sort of maniacal uh, learned man who's arrogant and thinks he's better than people like that's very much the seeds of the wolf are in kind of that Sherlock Holmes character and um, at will and uh, uh, Basil Rathbone would uh, meet again in the Sherlock Holmes series I believe he plays Moriarty in one of them you know I can't really uh, remember which one but uh, 
Uh, they're no, they're a good team. They definitely are pretty entertaining and uh, at uh, having that match of wills. Here we have um, the uh, Lionel Atwill detail the story of how the monster ripped out his arm by the roots. And uh, it, it sort of, you know, doesn't match up with the continuity of the original film. And I know I've mentioned in the... Uh, other um, commentaries how I'm kind of like how kind of obsessed I was with uh, uh, continuity in the uh, um, other commentaries but I think like I read an interesting article um, that uh, said that this movie was sort of the first reboot in a way of a classic franchise and it's kind of an interesting comparison i think um i think it's an interesting film in that it does it is very stylistically different from what whale did um we'll definitely uh see this play out uh Krog is telling them that a murdering ghost and uh, the crimes he's committed six unsolved murders a burst heart and um, the the um, villagers being superstitious of him I love at Will's uh, face. He's got a sternness to it and it is the role and he wears it very well. You know, I could see why he's been uh, typecasted as the inspector. He's always um, very good in the role and like at Will also plays really um, plays uh, kind of like sly devious figures very well too he's got very uh expressive eyes and uh he uses them very well yeah dreadful storm what awful lightning it's magnificent of course the lightning is what uh, brought the monster to life. And, you know, uh, Wolf here is explaining how nothing is terrifying once you learn to control it. And uh, that certainly is a theme of the film. We'll see that with the monster later on. He's very much a force like the lightning. Yeah, here we have a look at this... Uh, Massive, massive house with all these hidden passages, a doorknob, or like uh, walls that can creep out. And another look at Bela Lugosi's Igor staring in on cute little Donnie Dunk Dunnigan, Peter Frankenstein. Donnie Dunnigan, uh is one of the uh, fun things about this film. He's a sweet little boy. He's got those uh, almost girlish curls on him. <laughs> He's got his little nanny that accompanies him everywhere, too. Um, you know, Donnie Dunnigan is well, the, pretty much right now the last living link to these uh, classic horror films gosh he must be push he must be at least 87 or so he must almost be 90 but he played uh, Bambi and was sort of a cute little uh, uh, child star at the time and uh, 
he's like I've seen some interviews with him. He still is very uh, active in um, uh, you know talking about these movies, and he's very gracious to the opportunity he shares stories. He's also in the uh, Frankenstein Goes to Hollywood documentary. He's got a great line in there where he says that uh, he's the only person um, still sucking air that was held by Boris Karloff's Frankenstein. And, you know, that's joyful. <laughs> uh, he's also uh, a great character in this movie. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people... Um, criticize his performance because he's a little bit loud <laughs> certainly <clears throat> but um he's a lot of fun i think we'll definitely uh see him later on i think he's a pretty important part to the story he's very sweet and the interaction between him and the monster you know is um it's just as good as ever certainly goes back to the idea that um that Karloff always championed that uh the children were the ones who understood the monster best because they don't have the prejudices of the old and they know what it's like to be different and to you know have that uh fascination of the world there's the boiling hot uh sulfur pit which um Definitely is a huge set piece in this film. And he's walking around this uh, dilapidated uh, laboratory, which is um, supposed to be the uh, laboratory from Bride of Frankenstein. And here we're finally going to meet Bela Igor, who is in my opinion, the best thing this movie has uh, going for it. Yeah, a lot of people, I don't know if I'd say myself included, I probably wouldn't, but a lot of people feel that this is uh, Bela Lugosi's best performance, even better than Dracula. And I can certainly see the argument, you know, um, it's definitely a... Uh, it's definitely a performance I would go to if someone were to say, you know, Bela Lugosi were a one-dimensional actor. You compare this to pretty much uh, every um, every other uh, film he made, you know, and a lot of them. I mean, it's a fair criticism to say that he was asked to play a character similar to Dracula a lot, but instead of this one, Igor... He just looks and talks and feels uh, dirty, and he's completely uh, malevolent. He ha he has none, no uh, class whatsoever, and so you uh, can't compare him to Dracula at all. And he's got that uh, horrible, horrible laugh. Lugosi. Uh, loved the part and I think you'll definitely can see why because he would say that um, how he would always missed being able to play comedy and uh, Igor here delivers the blackest of humor <laughs> uh uh, Son of Frankenstein was a movie that um, kind of, like, you definitely, you hear about this kind of stuff happening today sometimes, where the movie went into production, it had, um, it had all these, you know, beautiful, extravagant sets, and, uh, like, it had, like, sort of a loose idea of what it wanted to do, but it was a movie that was filmed with 
the script being written simultaneously to the filming. And um, the studio, surprise, surprise, said, hey, we have Bela Lugosi, who's more desperate than ever. We can get him in on a quick uh, cameo and, uh, I don't know, pay him, like, chump change and then make a huge Karloff vehicle. And um, what happened was... Roland V. Lee recognized what an obvious uh, talent Lugosi was. And um, as he was writing the script, uh, they said, we want all of Lugosi's stuff to be done in one week. And uh, he said, oh, enough of that. And he actually gave Lugosi the biggest part of his entire, one of the biggest parts of his entire career, and certainly one of the best parts he ever had. And here we have the introduction of the monster, 30 minutes into the film. Played again by Boris Karloff. You know, um, this is the first uh, film I've done which features uh, Karloff and Lugosi together. And, you know, what a lot of people uh, fail to realize is that um, Karloff certainly was a huge horror star. And uh, no disrespect intended because he's great. But I think a lot of people give Lugosi the sort of the bums rush in a way because... Karloff collaborated a number of times with Lugosi's. They're in 11 or so movies together. And, you know, certainly you almost can say that uh, Boris Karloff, uh, you know, he needed uh, Lugosi in some ways to act off of. And, uh, they work really uh, well together in this movie. Although I will say that uh, the monsters, the monster um, after Bride of Frankenstein, where uh, he's so articulate and um, uh, you know he can speak, and uh, he comes to the realization that uh, he belonged dead. And so you almost uh, see say that the character, you know, he, he's come to a logical conclusion. He's come to a poetic conclusion. And so what more is there really to uh, do with him? And so seeing him in this film is a little bit underwhelming. But uh, you definitely, uh, it's not a bad film by any means. And it's not a bad performance by Karloff, but it's definitely the least interesting of the three he's done. He's really just um, playing the character in the same way that uh, he did in the original Frankenstein. But you'll see, you'll see he still has some great moments in the film. Um, this film really is about three men, uh, Wolf, Igor, and Krog. And the monster is kind of the bomb that they're all sort of playing with. And uh, obviously, Wolf uh, is in the middle. You know, he's not completely evil, uh, crazy, although he becomes pretty tempted by it. This is a great moment here. No one will know he's here until your creation father walks again. They desecrated his grave there and wrote Maker of Monsters. It's a, like, this is a great aspect of Wolf's character. The idea of family honor and a love for a father that 
he didn't get to know and wants to be able to make proud. Here we have uh, the city council and uh, they don't trust uh, the Frankensteins at all. Lionel uh, Belmore is in the film as one of the councilmen. And, um, of course, remember him as that uh, comical uh, burgomaster from the original film. And always will with a Frankenstein in our midst. Let's get Igor here and make him tell us. <laughs> That's, um, we'll definitely see Igor definitely has some plans for that, uh, council. <laughs> Already, we're sort of seeing Karloff's, uh, displeasure, um, with the part. You know, when they asked him why, uh, he didn't want to uh, play the monster again. He sort of used uh, the excuse that uh, he becomes sort of a prop in a way. And for a very large uh, portion of the film, the monster does nothing but uh, lie around. And um, I think you could definitely uh, see that Boris was right on the money because in the later uh, entries in the series that's what happens uh, the last Frankenstein film we did House of Frankenstein the monster is completely dead and limp and lifeless until one scene in the movie it's a far cry from the original Frankenstein where the monster uh, is loose sort of interacting with the world and um I can see why Boris Karloff felt bad about the character, but um, he certainly makes the most of it in this film, I think. Uh, it's de We definitely see the monster finally uh, get what gets what he wants. Like, you almost can say that the monster is the most content and happy in this film because he has old Igor as his uh, friend, but um, we'll definitely uh, find out that maybe Igor isn't the uh, best friend to have. You know, um, this movie is very methodical in its uh, buildup, and uh, we definitely see that uh, the monster hasn't entered the picture uh, yet as a moving, living, breathing character. But, uh, but um, I think that's a, actually a strong point of the film because it certainly does build up the action and it makes uh, the horror when it comes all the more frightening. Oh, Ben said he looks so frightened. <laughs> the makeup uh, on Karloff uh, doesn't really look uh, quite as uh, good, I don't think, in this film. Because Karloff's obviously aged almost 10 years. And um, I uh, almost, uh, you know, I want to tell, you don't know, I... Uh, oh gosh, what was I saying? You almost want to say that uh, the original Frankenstein, uh, the benefit of it that Karloff was a starving actor, sort of lent itself to the makeup. Um, sort of lent itself to the makeup, because you know part of the, part of it is the makeup uh, really matching the face. And uh. You know, you don't hear um, Lugosi's Igor 
as uh, being a great makeup by uh, Jack Pierce. Um, but it really is. Like, you've developed a whole broken neck for him that's really grim and frightening. And, of course, those horrible uh, teeth that Igor has are really, really uh, stand out. monster here is in a coma because he's been hit by uh, lightning and uh, wolf here is sort of doing the diagnostics on him and we get some more of that great B movie Frankenstein science where he tries to uh, explain away how the monster works and uh, what's happened to him and uh, you know this, these scenes uh, kind of test an actor, I think. And Rathbone, I think, does a really wonderful job here. Just like um, Karloff did in the last film. Because, you know, this these lines are... Uh, or Karloff did in House of Frankenstein. These lines are like complete uh, gibberish, you know. Like, there's no conceivable science here, and, you know, we'll just see. Um, uh, I like this. This is um, blood cells placed on top of sperm cells. It's kind of a, a goofy uh, trick, but it looks, like, gross, and it, and it definitely is. Uh, nice little thing they explain here the cells seem to be battling each other as if they had a conscious life of their own but you know when you have a doctor delivering pseudoscience there has to be passion and a fascination in it and uh, Rathbone definitely uh, has that Here we have Igor in what might just be the uh, best uh, scene in the movie. He's brought before the town council to testify about what's going on at um, the uh, Frankenstein castle and how the background of his character how he was hanged and pronounced dead and he wasn't dead. All the others, burgers, are pronounced dead over the last 30 years have been dead, haven't they? If Igor came to life again, it's the devil's work and not the courts. That's a great line. <laughs> Here we have um, Igor sort of, um, I mean, Lugosi as Igor sort of deliver that great uh, sly humor. <laughs> they bring up the fact that the uh, jury, uh, six members of that eight-man jury who uh, sentenced Igor to death are all dead. And, uh, you know, it might just be a giant uh, coincidence. <laughs> Eight men... <laughs> You too, Lang. I love that look on his face. How he's got that sly smile. And he talks, you know, like they talk, um, like he is just sort of like doesn't know anything. And obviously he's got tremendous rage for it. They die dead. I die alive. <laughs> It's one of the great moments of the movie, you know, and the Lugosi is so, like, grim and funny in his delivery of it. <laughs> and he uh, tops it off with pretending to cough, then spitting on the uh, juror. <laughs> I love how he's, like, washing off in the cough, and it, like, turns into, like, this huge... Uh, horrible laugh. <laughs> the 
creature was brought to life originally by an electrical impulse of terrifying potency. Some super violet ray. Life-giving properties. Yeah, see, here's that uh, goofy uh, science again. They're talking about... Uh, a cosmic ray, which uh, is the source of life itself, sort of like that life-giving uh, heaven, in a way. I think they use the term heavenly in this, I forget. There's no one part of his physical being that's like that of human beings. He's uh, every bit a monster. And uh, Frankenstein faces the dilemma uh, if he should be a good man and um, destroy the monster because he recognizes its danger or whether he as a scientist should um, restore it to its full power so he can see... Um, so he can see the scientific properties of it and, and uh, show the world how uh, powerful his name is and then be able to vindicate his father's memory to show him, to show the world everything, uh, to show the world um, what a great scientific achievement it was to bring this monster to life. Here the, here's the lab set, which isn't quite as impressive as when they did it in uh, the original Frankenstein, obviously. It's the first instance where they actually use uh, the electrodes for the original purpose that Jack uh, Pierce intended for them, uh, that they actually are what conduct the electricity. They're not like some bolt that uh, had the head on. I like Karloff's uh, action here. He sort of uh, moves around and like you see him twitch his lips a little bit as if he's getting uh, sustenance from the electricity. Here we have him uh, grunting again. You know, he can't talk anymore. I love little uh, Benson here. He grabs the scalpel, and he's the first one that uh, Frankenstein, uh, the, the monster, turns to. <laughs> Just to look a uh, sheer terror on his face. You know, there's a criticism in some ways of these later... Uh, films and you know just the fact that once they become uh, sequels that there isn't really any um, horror to uh, be had here and that's just really a case of you know familiar uh, you know just going through the tropes again just to please the audience and um I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. Like, I think this still works as a horror film in some ways, but, but you'll definitely have to see it later on. But yeah, this is definitely more of a film about the characters. And we'll see that with Krog here. He's uh, getting the villagers to uh, spy on Frankenstein. He's sort of uh, inserting himself uh, inviting himself over to uh, the uh, house and taking tea, sipping brandies, and sort of uh, uh, annoying wolf. Here we have uh, Elsa, the uh, wife of uh, um, Wolf, and uh, all she does in the picture is sort of sit around at the table and entertain Wolf and, um, or entertain Inspector Krogh, like she's completely, uh, oblivious to, um, what's going on, and it's kind of funny in a lot of ways, you know, um, 
you see you definitely see Krogh there uh, who doesn't really want to make friends with them but he sort of pretends to socialize and you see in Atwell's face like the same sternness like he's just uh, um, uh, like playing with them as an investigator and obviously Wolf's uh, lying too so these scenes are pretty interesting because uh, it goes into you know uh, the acting you know and how uh, as an actor you know the lines of dialogue aren't your intent at all and so uh, it kind of goes with the nuances of the character um, I like these here uh, how, uh, at will kind of gets nervous and testy and uh, obviously uh, Krog here uh, or not at will uh, Rathbone he kind of gets nervous and testy he's like fiddling with his uh, coffee you know trying to present a happy uh, face to his wife and at will obviously is questioning him you know it's a good one health resort about the uh, sulfur <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of exposition here about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. All the uh, sulfur can parboil everyone to the ground. And uh, um, uh, Wolf here, you know, he sort of shows the true intent of the character. You know, I'll have you come down and then parboil you sometime. And they both sort of know what's going on. <laughs> And here we have uh, Donnie uh, Dunnigan making another appearance, uh, entering the picture. He always uh, goes all in and says, well, hello. Well, he's not supposed to shake with his left hand. You in general, I like how he calls uh, Inspector Krog General. That's a good. That's some good acting on that. Well, like I said, he uses his uh, face pretty well. I, you see how ashamed he is about, uh, you know, being embarrassed about uh, his arm. And uh, of course, Peter here is uh, walking up by the giant giant what an imagination no Billy it wasn't an imagination I like that phrase animate imagination and of course um, they realize what's going on and then uh, poor crow you know he talks about how uh, the uh, monster grabbed at him and he reaches for his arm this is a great tense moment and sort of, you know, you see the facade uh, keeps crashing down and uh, they try to keep it going. The two of them look at each other. <laughs> I have to put the baby to bed. <laughs> and of course the maid and Elsa don't have any idea what's going on. But it's a great moment in the film. Some great acting by Atwill and Rathbone. <laughs> this house is so impractical. It's just like living on a giant soundstage. A lot of fun for sure. I love the shadows here too. Look at that. That's definitely... Um, Definitely uh, showing that universal uh, spared no expense in this one. This one looks much more impressive in a lot of ways than, um, in some ways, than the original Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. I mean, there's some great sets in there, but it's um, less of a spectacle than uh, this film. There's some. Uh, 
uh, great set pieces in this movie where they just want to show the epicness of what's going on. Obviously, when we saw the original, um, the scene with Igor meeting Wolf in the uh, uh, laboratory, and of course later on when we have uh, the monster and Peter at the finale of the picture. But um, Universal really went out a lot with this. Of course, um, one of the thing, great trivia facts about this movie is that uh, they originally intended for it to uh, be shot in Technicolor. And um, uh, contrary to popular belief, there's uh, some shots of the monster in color. And they're the first... Um, instances, you know, where the classic uh, thing about the monster's uh, skin being green, it, it comes from that um, because that was what would show up on the color film stock. And there was some uh, test footage shot of Karloff in uh, the makeup, uh, but that's not what you see. Like, there's some clips. Um, I think they're either Jack Pierce's home movies or Karloff's home movies where it's the first and I think only time you get a look at the monster makeup in color. And, uh, you know, as cool as that uh, would have been, I definitely... Uh, I definitely uh, prefer the movie in black and white because there's some really great black and white cinematography in this film. You know, you wouldn't be able to appreciate uh, this movie the same way, I think, if we're in color, especially the use of these shadows here. You see Wolf running up those uh, ladders, the ladder. Um, I'm really, you know, just thinking about that, I'm really surprised that uh, Universal um, didn't uh, experiment with uh, putting their Frankenstein or Dracula in color during the 80s when they had that uh, uh, Ted Turner um, fad where he colorized all the old movies. I think the black and white is a large part of the appeal of the universe classics. Here we have uh, Karloff's monster. He's finally um, come to life about an hour into the picture. I love uh, this moment here because it shows Karloff doing what he did best at the monster, showing that sort of childlike fascination. And Rathbone is great here. He looks utterly uh, terrified. And, of course, the monster uh, is experimenting with the face. He, like, grabs the stranglehold and uh, he moves back at uh, the notion of uh, Rathbone choking back. And he sees the monster, sees and recognizes... Uh, Henry in the face of Basil Rathbone. And it sort of works because I guess you could say that uh, Basil Rathbone sort of looks at, uh, looks like Colin Clive and the poor monster uh, with his reflection in the mirror. He hates it and he tragically realizes that that ugly uh, thing staring back at him is himself. Yeah, this is a great little moment, and it's Karloff doing what he does best. I love that he grabs uh, Rathbone and uh, uh, brings him to the mirror, too, and sort of, like, wishes that uh, Rathbone was him in a way. <laughs> you know, uh... Karloff, uh, when they made Bride of Frankenstein, he was really sort of disappointed in the fact that the monster was given uh, dialogue because he sort of thought 
some of the appeal was in, uh, taken away. And, you know, looking at some of these moments, you definitely see that uh, it takes a great uh, talent to bring the monster to life without the dialogue. And he's almost a uh, more interesting uh, character. This is one of the uh, best uh, moments of the film. And uh, Igor is going to uh, come up and help his uh, friend out. Here's um, what you could say is one of the uh, few uh, complaints uh, you can have uh, with the film. Um, the monster, uh, the monster kind of becomes uh, Igor's toy uh, in a lot of ways. Um, um, it's kind of disappointing in some ways because, you know, obviously it kind of wastes Karloff's talents and, uh, you know, he becomes sort of a prop like he was afraid he would be but um it's just like uh it's just kind of like um you know it's just sort of disappointing in some ways because it makes the monster i think it lo he loses some of his potency he wished there was a moment in the film where he defies Igor. And it's kind of like weird, some of the stuff with the monster. Like he like, Igor like pets him and uh, rubs his hands to get him back. And you definitely, um, he's well enough for me and you'll now touch him again. <laughs> But you definitely, uh, I think, I, uh, you can see from the monster's point of view in some ways why he uh, loves Igor so much. Because, um, obviously, uh, nobody uh, was friendly to the monster in the two films. And so you see the monster with Igor. He has a friend, and uh, he wants to do everything to please him obviously you know you i think the film uh might have worked a little bit better had um maybe the monster uh been a little smarter than he is here because uh i think in this one he comes off a little dull uh, he wasn't this dull in uh, the original Frankenstein, obviously, even though Karloff takes a lot of cues from that uh, performance. But uh, I think if the monster were a little bit uh, more intelligent in the movie, he could have still had that. Um, he definitely could articulate it maybe a little bit more why, uh, how much he loved Igor. And I think it would have made the uh, um, film a little bit uh, better. And, uh, you know, um, it, it would have made the monster, I think, a little bit more uh, sympathetic, too. Because, obviously, we're going to see um, the monster... Uh, we're going to see the monster enact Igor's uh, terrible uh, revenge scheme. And that's one thing about the monster in the first two films is that he was never uh, that malicious. He would never kill anyone out of uh, homicidal rage. Uh, of course, Igor will, but um, the monster wouldn't. You know, you would almost wish there was a moment maybe where the monster... Uh, realized what he was doing was wrong. 
here the monster is Igor is finally going to get his uh, great revenge and there's Boris and Bela on the screen together you know when uh, you look at the collaborations uh, that uh, Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff had um, I almost think that uh, oh he's returning the spit <laughs> I almost think Bela Lugosi uh, comes out in to on top. Uh, um, they're in The Black Cat together, which is a great film, which we're probably, surprise, surprise, we're probably going to do in a future episode of the show. I, I, I want to go back to this film. I'll, I'll go back to that uh, train of thought, but... um. This is one of the few really horrific uh, moments in the movie. You know, obviously this is a movie where there's a lot of dialogue. You know, it's sort of very character-driven. But this is really, really uh, frightening and pretty uh, intense and grisly. You know, the monster definitely is sort of uh, mean and malicious here and how he murders this guy. He, even uh, Igor has him trained to the point where uh, he um, knows to uh, make the horses run over the body. And there's Igor's old uh, twisted horn, which, of course, he exploits the monster's love of music. And uh, that calming effect he almost has... Uh, the ability to train him like a dog, but yeah, this is a this is a great sequence in the film. Yep, Lugosi's malicious smile to uh, top it off, and uh, there's not a lot of dialogue there. It's all about the presence and uh, the acting on the terms of Karloff. But um. Going back to the collaborations of Bela and Boris, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, obviously assume that Karloff really uh, comes out on top. But I think Lugosi is actually uh, a lot better. And I, I actually think he's a lot better in some of the films to the point where I think he steals the picture from Karloff, steal the pictures from Karloff, and obviously, uh, this is one of them, and, you know, it's really, um, it's really kind of surprising, because, you know, obviously, this is, uh, Karloff's best, uh, character, his most beloved character, and he does a really good job playing him here, even, even though, like, there's not a, a lot to, uh, do by the third film more with the character, but obviously this is um, Igor's film in a lot of ways. Um, but also, I think Bela uh, comes up and to on top in a lot of them. Like, the only one I really think um, where uh, Boris totally outdoes uh, Bela Lugosi is um, the... Uh, Body Snatcher, which is a pretty sad film, because by the time they get to that, uh, Bela's pretty old and feeble looking, and he's only there to get him a credit, but uh, otherwise, usually I think Bela Lugosi plays the more interesting character. Here we have... Um, you know, you look at this movie, I think, more so than the other ones, and you you see uh, young Frankenstein, like the DNA of young Frankenstein. Obviously, they're very similar uh, pictures because of um, young Frankenstein is about uh, is about um, uh, the son of Frankenstein or the grandson. In that case, uh, you can almost say he's the 
Donnie Dunnigan grown up coming to uh, the ancestral uh, homeland and sort of taking up the family business. Uh, it's a similar plot, but you know, you definitely see it. Like, they borrow a lot of visual cues and like jokes. Obviously, uh, Kenneth Mars. His uh, Krogue impression is so unforgettable, and he's brilliant in that movie. But also the idea of the knockers, that's a huge joke in Young Frankenstein, you know, the pounding knockers. And then you have Gene Wilder with Inga. What knockers? Oh, thank you. <laughs> you definitely, uh, more than the other ones, I definitely see a lot of Young Frankenstein in this movie here. And it's... No wonder it's a good film. Uh, I could definitely see why Mel Brooks and Gene Wilder love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a weird thing about this, their relationship, that the monster needs uh, um, Bela petting him to sleep. <laughs> You definitely, uh, you definitely, um, appreciate, uh, how much the monster loves Igor. And, uh, even though Igor is pretty, uh, brutal, later on in the film you feel bad for him when Igor gets his, uh, just desserts. <laughs> course um here we are at the autopsy and uh of course at will believes that uh the heart has burst examine the back of the neck <laughs> that's an especially uh, gruesome image uh burst heart <laughs> No, this is really uh, grim here. You have Igor walk past the uh, um, door of the laying the apothecary, and he puts the uh, X on it. It almost reminds you of the biblical uh, story of Moses and how uh, the plagues came to kill the firstborn sons unless they uh, put the marks on there. I, I'm not sure. I think uh, the uh, I'm gonna have to look again at the do door of the apothecary office. But I think his name was Fritz Lang, which would be a pretty neat uh, tribute if it was um, there. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. Here, Lang. <laughs> Here we have um, the wolf character sort of uh, come into the next phase of it. He's sort of realizing that uh, this whole idea maybe wasn't so smart. And he's sort of wanting to get control over everything because he realizes that the monster is um, uncontrollable and that Igor is... Uh, doing some pretty nasty things. And um, like I said earlier, Wolf uh, is an interesting multi-faceted uh, character. He's not like Henry, because I think Henry doesn't get as mean as or malicious as Wolf does. Wolf definitely has sort of a evil glimpse to him. And, you know, uh, he has the potential to do terrible things. But I think he comes from good intentions, too. Obviously, he wants to clear his father's name. And it's because he loves his father. And he, too, is intrigued by the idea of finding what lies beyond. But I think he... Oh, it's Emil Lang, not Fritz Lang. Um, it's too bad. Well, it would have been nice. 
here, here's another good uh, moment here. It's all done in shadow, this pretty grisly murder. Oof. <laughs> Man. That, that, that does have some good uh, horror in there. Here we have the European uh, village set again. I think this is where uh, Dwight Fry had initially uh, filmed his little uh, piece for this film. This is the only Frankenstein movie that he uh, is not in. But I think he was originally in it, and they just cut it out for time. You know, you can't imagine this movie being much longer than it actually is. And they're worrying about poor uh, Benson and, uh, you know, all these goofy uh, excuses that um, uh, uh, Wolf comes up with to make up for all these things. I love that little uh, snippet um, where they have the wooden arm and he puts the matchbox over the finger to light his uh, cigarette. <laughs> Uh, you really do a, a great job of reminding you of the extent of Krogh's character and that gruesome wooden arm. You know, they uh, really take their time to remind you of it. You know, it has a lot of effect here. Another best heart. Oh, you have that look of sheer terror on uh, uh, Rathbone's face because he knows that the noose is tightening around him. You know, the same noose that uh, got Igor. Oh, I love that uh, smile on Igor's face. He's having his revenge on the town, and he's finally... Uh, <laughs> oh, that horn it's so creepy that's I like the mob there too it's a little bit more um, a little bit more uh, gruesome than uh um, than they usually is because they're armed with like axes and pitchforks, not just torches. You know, it just seems a little bit more, um, a little bit more violent in a lot of ways. And uh, it's it's fun, you know. Like the mob is definitely one of the great aspects of these uh, Frankenstein films. <laughs> safe here here we have the the that aspect of the wolf character that I like he's sort of the rich guy and he says one of those simple-minded villagers comes I'll shoot them down <laughs> oh this one at once I like um Rathbone here. Shall we go into the library? <laughs> here we definitely have uh, Krogh have the higher ground and the war of wits between them. That is a guest in my own home. You'll find me extremely disagreeable. Oh, a meal laying and <laughs> that shrill scream and that that woman's great there. She reminds you of uh, Uno Connor from uh, the Whale films. You know you got to have a good scream in there. Oh, we got little Dottie Dottie get in a sailor outfit. <laughs> 
oh man, you know, I can see the parents, you know, getting him that goofy uh, haircut uh, to make him just as cute as possible. I saw, I've seen some, um, uh, I've seen some uh, stills or, you know, some autograph photos from around this time of uh, Donnie Dunnigan signing it. I think they're promotional materials either for this movie, or I don't think it was for this movie, I think it was for Bambi, but, um, like, it's really kind of goofy the way that they signed the name, I'm sure it was the parents, you know, it's all cutesy-wootsy signed in the, like, crayon, and, uh, the, uh, letters are spelled backwards, it's just perfectly, uh, uh, perfectly, um, uh, encapsulates, you know, the idea of the child actor and the over-domineering parents. But he lived a he's lived a pretty good life, Donnie Donnie. He didn't stick with acting. He became a, um, a military instructor. I believe he might have fought in Korea, but he was with the Marines, and he it seems like a really nice guy. I love the interviews with him. I like that look, too, on uh, Benson's face when he's with the boy. Uh, or not Benson, uh, Krogh's face when he sees the uh, watch is uh, Benson's watch that the giant gave him. <laughs> I wish they would have um, filmed some of that scenes with uh, the monster and Igor, because it's, or the monster and uh, little uh, Peter, because, you know, uh, those are great moments when the monster interacts with the child, the innocent child. You know, of course, the unforgettable uh, moment in the original Frankenstein with Marilyn Harris. Uh, one of the uh, most, um, like, one of the great images of that film is uh, Karloff's monster with that big smile showing those teeth and his, uh, like his even his sunken cheeks sort of uh, brighten up and that and I would have loved to have seen that in this film too but he does have uh, some good moments here with uh, the boy later on in the film at the climactic moment She's not really all that, um, Ilsa here isn't really all that good, uh, female lead in this film, and that's, you know, unfortunate, but, um, you do have some strong characters here, and so it almost, uh, almost, uh, don't mind it quite as much, but, um, she does everything she's supposed to do. I like the fact that there is a little boy in the movie, and she is, she does well in, you know, showing that she really loves her son, and, you know, it gives the movie some stakes, because you do fear for, uh, fear for, um, the boy and the wife, you know, their innocence and all of this. Here we have really, like, the, uh, yeah, another great moment in the movie it's really, really gruesome. You know, uh, Wolf goes because he realizes that the, what he has to do is to kill the monster before he hurts anyone else. Because he knows that he can't uh, control him. And he grabs this huge chunk of uh, concrete to bash the monster's head in. You know, you wouldn't think that... Uh, wouldn't... You made him kill her more <laughs> And say, Eagle, hang now, eight men dead. <laughs> Krog finds him, will kill him. They won't be good to either of us. monster <laughs> comes to life you see that Igor isn't a good friend of the monster 
because he sees him as nothing but a prop or nothing but a piece of property. Yeah, that's pretty gruesome, the scythe at the end of it. And, and uh, you know, it really uh, shows that, you know, before something becomes a uh, parody, that uh, it has a uh, strong impact, the mob. Here's another uh, great moment in the movie with the inspector and uh, Wolf playing darts. And by this point in the movie, they're just going through the uh, formalities, you know. Um, Wolf offering him a brandy still. <laughs> See you disturbed before. He's not forgotten to take off his hat. It's merely a matter of form. He's going to arrest the Baron. A year of uh, Rathbone at his most uh, his most manic. You know, uh, you know, Rathbone's obviously a very uh, intelligent actor. And, you know, he you don't see him like this very much. He's like screaming and frothing at the mouth. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> I've heard it before. Oh, well, they'll suppose I kill them all the same. <laughs> well, haven't you heard? It's the monster. <laughs> <laughs> my father's time or am I supposed to have whooped one up as there was a housewife whips up an omelet <laughs> wife and child are in danger it's Igor Igor is the one who's uh, caused all this uh, trouble, obviously, and you'll see uh, the monster uh, murder of Benson technical charge for the time being. My permission. Without your permission. <laughs> Incriminating. I like this moment too, and like it does sort of go into um, how the, uh, this movie is about the father and the son. You see the giant portrait of uh, Colin Clive uh, staring over um, everything here, and uh, uh, um, later on we'll see. Uh, um, Inspector Krogh say that uh, Wolf Frankenstein is a worse fiend than his father. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's a good uh, take on the uh, character and that, you know, uh... oh, no, it's not this moment. It's later on. But it's, um, it's good. It's a good scene. I like it a lot. Um, you're going to have them confront old Igor. Of course, Krog has some uh, more work to do. It's a pretty grim moment, too, where Krog... Uh, is uh, searching for Benson's body and he finds it in a secret passage in the walls. You know, this set's incredible here. <laughs> I wonder uh, if they filmed any more movies on this because this is just um, uh, really elaborate the amount of time they put into, or the amount of detail that goes into the walls. Here we have Igor with his uh, hammer, 
trying to murder um, Wolf. Oh man, yeah, this this finale is actually uh, pretty uh, grim. You know, you see Igor shot at pretty uh, close range, and Lugosi uh, does a good job there, sort of showing the uh, showing the um, dying there. And we go back to uh, Krog here looking for uh, Benson's body and seeing it lie on the floor, you know, with him being so uh, helpless, you know, it just reminds you that uh, this isn't just uh, fun and games, you know, I, you know, this is definitely a horror film in the uh, same mold of the classic ones. It's not, um, it's not just the swashbuckler as our, as uh, great Mark Gatiss called, called it. Yeah. The guy who played Benson was actually in... Uh, the name escapes me at the moment. I'll remember it later on. But he's a... Um, Dr. J he's in the original Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with Friedrich March. And he plays the same role in that film as Dr. Jekyll's butler. Pretty good actor. Here we have uh, Karloff's uh, best moment in the movie. You know, I sort of criticized, um, in some aspects, the uh, relationship between uh, Igor and the monster. I think, um, but there's uh, there's nothing. Um, bad about this scene. You see poor Karloff like scream at the top of his lungs that his friend is gone and that he's all alone again. That scream is um, so powerful that uh, it's actually been used as a uh, sound clip and um, uh, you know a stock sound in a lot of uh, Universal films. I don't know if, uh, I don't know um, which films exactly it's been in, but it's, it's in a few. The most notable instance is in um, uh, House of Frankenstein, which we watched. Um, uh, it's there when uh, the monster throws uh, Daniel out of the ho uh, out of the laboratory, and he falls to his death. He screams there. It's actually uh, Karloff uh, screaming there, and I think now don't quote me as um, don't quote me as uh, po positive as being uh, positive about this, but um, I think it's in one of the Black Lagoon films too. Although that might just be a figment of my, my imagination. This is that moment I was talking about where uh, Krog uh, calls him a worse fiend than his father. And all Atwill can do is sort of smile smugly. You know, the tables have kind of turned. It's Krog doesn't have the power now and he's just so furious and uh, sort of desperate to get that monster and uh, all uh, uh, Wolf can do, he sort of has the upper hand and says, oh, I wouldn't put it past you. Would you like to play darts? <laughs> they kind of go back to, you know, the sort of fake formalities that they're uh, friends. Uh, this is tragic here. You see the monster bring Igor uh, to the crypt and the poor guy is crying over his friend. See, that's uh, Karloff. Uh, really, this is why Karloff is remembered and why that monster is uh, such a classic uh, character. 
I love the fact that he just growls and goes into a great rage over everything. Wants to destroy all these uh, instruments that brought him to life. Because uh, he sort of sees them as what's wrong with his life. You know, that his only friend is gone and, you know, people have been poking and uh, prodding at him. And that he uh, doesn't have any humanity in that one aspect of humanity, his friend, even though he wasn't a very good uh, friend, um, is gone. So the only thing he has left is the boy here. We'll see. Um, you wonder th this ending here, um, it, what the monster, uh, intends to, uh, do with the boy. Uh, you know, initially, uh, I thought he wanted to take the boy and, um, throw him in the sulfur pit as, you know, just another piece of, uh, just another piece of lab equipment. But I think, um, like, I'd rather, like, interpret it another way. I, I think it leaves something o open for interpretation. Uh, because we'll definitely see it, it later on in the grand finale of the film that the monster has some opportunities to uh, harm the boy but uh, protects him at the same time so you wonder um, Igor's effect on the monster if he's really turned him into a, a horrible being Yeah, this is a pretty exciting finale. You know, obviously, uh, the relationship between uh, Krog and uh, Wolf has kind of hit its crescendo point. I like uh, this uh, intense game of darts, and, of course, the Krog sticks them in his wooden arm. The boy's gone. Little Peter. Um... He's gone. <laughs> and of course, um, Basil Rathbone, Wolf, knows exactly where it is. I, li I like this um, point in the movie and what it does the character because, um, you know, uh, Basil Rathbone's uh, Wolf is a pretty awful uh, father to his boy. And I think what brings him out of this uh, slump are, you know, not slumped, you know, this frame of mind is that he's realizing that he's so concerned about being a son to Henry and uh, that he forgets that he's a father to uh, Peter. And I think that's a good aspect because eventually uh, Wolf is redeemed at the end of the movie. He's, he uh, becomes a, he gets out of the maliciousness and the, uh, preoccupation with the monster and uh, does the right thing by uh, leaving the community and um, uh, letting it have its peace. Here's an unforgettable moment where uh, the monster rips off the wooden arm again. Here's the moment I was talking about. You think that uh, um, the monster is going to attack, uh, little Peter, but instead he protects him from, uh, uh, the bullets and waves the, uh, thing, uh, the arm around him. And of course he's one more thing added to the sulfur pit. There's that other scream too, when he falls in there. I wonder if that's the one that they use with Daniel because Karloff, He's a good uh, screamer, that's for sure. But um, conveniently, uh, Igor is not dead. He, uh, you know, took, you know, he 
hanging him didn't kill him. Breaking his neck didn't kill him. Uh, it just sort of wounded him. And so what do you think? Five bullets in him? That won't kill him either. And you think that the uh, sulfur pit was enough to burn and parboil the monster? No, he'll be back. He'll be back. And uh, not, not quite as impressive as uh, this one. But the monster comes back in The Ghost of Frankenstein, which... It's this film on a smaller scale. And a little bit... They do a little bit... Um, uh, some interesting things. But of course, that this is Karloff uh, saying uh, goodbye to the monster. Here, Benson is played by Edgar Norton in the end credits. That's it. Uh, he's good in the movie. Uh... But that'll be the end of it until uh, next time. I hope you enjoyed the film. It's a good one. It's um, everything you love about these uh, uh, classic monster movies. It definitely has all the great tropes. And you'll see that um, I think what I like about it best is its acting and the fact that it's a really uh, very character driven uh, film and uh, you know as a Lugosi fan you really can't ask for a better movie than uh, Son of Frankenstein uh, you know uh, Lugosi's Igor reminds us that uh Nothing will stay dead. That Igor can't stay dead. And the same is true about Basil Rathbone and Karloff and certainly Lionel Atwell. I hope you enjoyed the movie and enjoyed that little cheesy uh, note to go out on. But I'm sure we'll have more Frankenstein in the future to look forward to. Until then, have a good evening and enjoy. Cheers. But um, Lugosi is completely devastated. He doesn't get any film work for a stretch of about two years. And during this time, he loses um, the house that Dracula brought, bought. He gets foreclosed on. And his son is born, and he can't afford to... Uh, pay the medical bills and he has to apply to the union to get some aid in that and horror films were gone I guess Hollywood had the bright notion that people didn't want to see horror films anymore but um, but of course they aren't the smartest people and around 1938, or late 37, 38, a uh, theater in Los Angeles that's run by a German immigrant, I believe his name was Emil Human, something along those lines. His theater is failing, and uh, in a last-ditch effort, or I don't even know if it was last-ditch effort, it was just something different he uh, arranges a double no actually people forget but it was actually a triple bill of dracula frankenstein and the son of kong <laughs> talk about uh underwhelming third picture of it but uh he discovers that Horror is very much alive, that audiences never really want to completely be rid of horror. And this picture is, um, I mean, this uh, promotion is an outstanding success. And uh, the lines run across the block. His theater is saved. He's making record profits. And Universal finds out about this because they obviously lease the films out to him fairly cheaply. And they're like, what?
the heck is going on here? And so they, this opening sequence is, uh, covers a pretty large portion of the film, but it does a really good job in creating a foreboding sense of mood. I, like we see, um, I think it's a good idea or a wise choice by Roland Lee because, um, you know, I think audiences going into this movie kind of knew or they thought they knew what um, a film like this was. And so, um, you know, just going through it and really painstakingly developing Wolf's character kind of makes the introduction of the monster have some weight to it because he's out of commission a fair amount of this film. We have um, Benson. <laughs> One of the uh, biggest differences between uh, Bride of Frankenstein and Wales original Frankenstein in this film is that the village plays a huge uh, part of the story. Um, the villagers in the town hate Henry Frankenstein. There we have a picture of Colin Clive. It actually does sort of look like him if you pause it there. And that's certainly a big uh, theme of the film. Basil Rathbone has uh, is Wolf Frankenstein has never met his father and he's sort of in the shadow of him. And he hears all these horrible rumors about him and he wants to be able to vindicate him. And so uh, a large portion of the film is about uh, an almost vengeance in a way. This Wolf Frankenstein is a little more arrogant than um, Colin Clive's Henry was. He definitely views the, um, the peasants, like decide, hey, this might be a great opportunity to make some money. And so they say, will this work in other areas of the country? And so they print, create, uh, strike about... I don't know, like 500 prints of Dracula and Frankenstein to market across the country. And surprise, surprise, uh, the same success is met everywhere. People are as much in love with the monsters as they were in 1931. And so Universal says, let's get back in the monster business. And... We get the son of Frankenstein, which picks up the action about a generation or so after the Bride of Frankenstein, which, as we know, kind of ended on a conclusive note. And so a lot of things are different here. Um, I think you'll notice right away that uh, there isn't that sardonic wit that we got from Whale. Instead, that this is uh, more of a, I would say, I've heard it compared to a swashbuckling film, more of a family-friendly film uh, in the documentary Frankenstein Goes to Hollywood, which is an outstanding uh, documentary. If you haven't seen it, Mark Gatiss of Sherlock fame called it uh, kind of uh, Earl Flynn swashbuckler meets uh, Frankenstein. And I don't know if I quite agree with that, but I just do sort of see the comparison. Everything's a little bit bigger in this one. Um you'll notice that this is the longest universal horror film and the sets 
are some of the most extravagant. They really went all out with this, and uh, it's very noticeable. Um, it's directed by Roland V. Lee, who also did a companion piece to this film called The Tower of London, which is kind of like a Richard the uh, Third. Hello, commentary fans. This is Mike again, and we I am back with the next commentary in the Titus Andronicus commentary project. Um, we're going to do another Frankenstein film today, The Son of Frankenstein, which is a very good, uh, it's a great horror film in the classic Universal series. And it's great for a lot of, some different reasons than the first two Frankenstein films. In a lot of ways, it represents the last, um, a, I would say, horror, horror film of the Universal Cycle to really be an A horror film before they became B movies. And it's a great film to celebrate. Um, you know, we did Batman's 75th anniversary celebration last time, and this film is also celebrating its 75th anniversary, so... Let's not waste any time and get into it. I'm paused right before the Universal logo comes up. And I'm going to start the film in three seconds like we always do. One, two, and three. This is the first film of the second uh, part of the Universal Horror Cycle. The Lemleys are no ru no longer running Universal. Um, it's changed hands, and around 1935 or so, the censorship gets to be a bit too much, especially in Great Britain, and they decide to completely end production of horror movies. And it's not just Universal; it's pretty much across the board. And unfortunately, this devastates the career of Bela Lugosi. Uh, Karloff, I think, is does a little bit better. He's considered something of a character actor, and uh, he's able to, you know, step out of the Frankenstein persona. He gets a little bit of work, melodrama, horror, fantasy. And uh, it's kind of a costume drama. And I think that's sort of what I think uh, Son of Frankenstein feels like in some ways. Uh, here we have uh, Basil Rathbone, who I haven't introduced yet. He plays Wolf, the son of uh, Colin Clive's Henry Frankenstein. And um, you're in the midst of a rainstorm at the beginning of the film. Wolf's an interesting character. He's, uh... They really go into his motivations over the course of the film, and I think it's an interesting uh, exploration of the classic mad scientist trope. I think we'll see here in this film how, you know, the intent of the scientist kind of becomes mad later on. And Basil Rathbone is uh, terrific in the part. And um, we also have Lionel Atwill, who I don't believe we've been introduced to yet. But this is his finest uh, work. He plays Inspector Krog. There's the first hint at Bela Lugosi, who um, I definitely think is the highlight of this picture. Here's some of this outstanding set design. This looks like it 
took up an entire soundstage, and it's just really, really incredible. You know, um, we've obviously talked about uh, German expressionism a great deal on the on this channel, and um, I really think Son of Frankenstein does a really fine job of marrying German expressionist sets to the lavish Hollywood production. Look at that staircase. It looks like something on a Caligari. 